Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ansi Dumontier, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this um, um, webinar about um, hand instrument ergonomics. On behalf of LM Dental and Plameka, um, welcome and thank you for joining. A um, couple of practicalities. So as you heard, uh, your microphones will be muted, but if you have questions during the presentation, please use that chat function. We'll be monitoring and asking questions um, um, as needed. And also at the end of the presentation, there will be allocated time that we can answer your questions and hopefully also have uh, discussions, okay? Uh, there is also raise your arm function. Please feel free to use that as well. And then we can mute you, um, sorry, unmute you so you can uh, voice your questions. The webinar is recorded. And without further ado, it is our pleasure to introduce our speaker, presenter, dental educator, key opinion leader, a friend, Dr. Voigt, Dr. Joy Voigt Holmes. The East stage is yours. Thank you, Ansi. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us for this presentation today. Um, it is my pleasure to talk about a topic that is very near and dear to me, um, and that's all things with instrumentation, but particularly ergonomics. Okay. So um, before we get started, I just wanted to put this disclaimer here. So the opinions, my opinions expressed are not necessarily those views of LM. So you should certainly apply your own professional judgment and your experience with respect to all of the information provided today. So just to tell you a little bit about myself, I am currently the program chair at Fortis College Landover, the dental hygiene program and adjunct faculty at the American Dentora School. Um, I received my initial education in dental hygiene at Howard University um, and finished it with my doctorate in health sciences. Um, I do own my own business, Dr. Joy RDH, uh, where you know I do a lot of writing, speaking, I am a key opinion leader, a lot of product research, and um, for fun, I actually like to apply eyelash extensions, but I am most proud of my wonderful family. My husband, Kevin, and I have been married for 25 years. We celebrated 25 years this past December, and we have four amazing children, ranging in ages from 25 to eight years old. So I'm gonna get started talking today, and I'm going to cut my camera off just to make sure that um, we are paying attention completely to my words, okay? So what we're gonna talk about today is, um, of course, the ergonomics behind handle design. And specifically, we're gonna talk about um, musculoskeletal disorders that are commonly experienced by dental health professionals. Um, what causes them and how can we prevent them? We're also going to discuss periodontal instrument design features that support ergonomic health for dental practitioners. And then we're going to explore the benefit of silicone instrument handles in improving hand comfort and reducing hand fatigue. So where are we now? What has prompted this discussion? So on January 30th, 2020, the World Health Organization, um, along with other uh, world agencies, they issued new guidelines for the practice of dentistry because there was an outbreak, a COVID-19 outbreak across the world. And since then, um, new guidelines such as uh, reduction of aerosol generating procedures is what has been commonplace now in dentistry. And so while many may think that these are temporary guidelines, I'm here to tell you that they simply are not. What we are currently witnessing is a paradigm shift in dentistry in terms of how we provide care to our patients, the tools that we use, and most importantly, infection control protocols. And the last time um, that I can say that I was a part of any type of paradigm shift like this in dentistry uh, was back in the 1980s, um, and that was on the heels of the HIV AIDS pandemic. So just to help give you perspective, as of March 15, 2021, um, there have been over 119 million cases. 
Um, and it's these cases are continuously rising. I believe last year, you know, most people thought, oh, you know, at the beginning of 2021, this will be over. And actually, in October of 2020, there were only 37.7 million cases. And the reason why I'm highlighting these numbers is just to help give you perspective that, you know, the way that the guidelines that we have in place and the way that we're practicing dentistry right now are going to be here to stay for a while. Total deaths, okay, you know, two, two million, a um, little over two million, almost three million, but we've had uh, 67 uh, million people who have recovered. And so what does that mean? That means that many of you are going to be treating patients who have recovered from COVID. They're going to be suffering um, COVID-like respiratory and airway complications, which are for, you know, there are going to be additional guidelines put in place to care for these patients. So it's just important for us to accept that the impact of COVID has truly shaped the future of our profession and will certainly impact um, the types of tools that we need and how we need to care for our patients moving forward. So by now, most dental professionals have returned to work or some version of what their life was like pre-COVID. They are adjusting to the new normal. Um, again, all changes in types of the guidelines with PPE. Again, new guidelines for aerosol producing procedures. And um, a lot of people are experiencing what I call the 2H phenomenon. And what does that mean? it means that you are either hurting or you are extremely hot, right? So with all the PPE, the extra layers, you know, people are just uncomfortable. Um, but of course, now that people are back to work with the PPE and they're no longer allowed to use, let's say the ultrasonics or air polishing, they're having to hand scale more. And so they're having to put themselves in really creative positions. So their, their neck is hurting, their back is hurting, and again, most importantly, their hand. So we're going to launch the first poll question. Okay, so what part of your body is negatively affected by the task you perform in the office? And I'll give you guys a few seconds to answer that. Okay, we could share those results, please. Yes, absolutely. So 12% uh, neck, 14% hand, 8% back, 5% arm, and 62% all of the above. Okay, so there's a lot of pain here in today's audience. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you, and thank you, Auntie, for sharing those results. So today I'm going to talk to you about ergonomic considerations of handle designs that may help alleviate some of the problems. So, you know, everything is connected. And so only eight, although only 8% of you are experiencing problems in your hand, what you may not realize is that some of that pain could be radiating up your arm, um, you know, into your shoulders, affecting the neck and the back. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to provide you with some information that can help you um, to feel better, especially while you're performing tasks such as periodontal debridement. So ergonomics, you've heard me say that term a few times. So what does that mean? Um, so I'm just going to read the information off the slide because I think it's really important that we all have a solid understanding of ergonomics. It's not just about how you're sitting. So ergonomics is the study of human performance and work design. It is an applied science concerned with the fit between people and their technological tools and environments. So and I'll, I, I highlighted environments. But I also uh, want to bring your attention to the word tools. Um, it's making products and tasks comfortable and efficient for the user. So it's making things easy for you to do. 
And then it deals with the equipment, meaning the equipment should be designed to fit the user instead of forcing the user to fit the equipment. And I want you to really focus on that. If something isn't working and you're constantly having to make adjustments to make that work for you, you may need to consider an alternative. And so with COVID, of course, there has been a renewed focus on the use of hand instrumentation and then a renewed focus on ergonomics. Um, it's an absolute must when you are working in an office, especially when you're performing periodontal debridement, that you have the tools, the correct tools that you need to get the job done. It becomes hazardous for you not to. And far too often people make exceptions for not having the tools that they, they don't have. And you know, why is that, right? So we launched the poll. We talked about the different parts of the body that are hurting you. Um, and these happen to be all the parts of the body that are impacted by poor ergonomics. And as you can see, it's just about every part of the body. Um, the result of poor ergonomics, um, you get greater incidences of repetitive strain injuries, and then you have a greater incidence of developing a musculoskeletal disorder. So by definition, what is a musculoskeletal disorder? So it's any injury that affects the musculoskeletal system um, over a period of time. So your muscles, your tendons, and your nerves. And then your repetitive strain injuries, those are common musculoskeletal disorders in dentistry. And they're a range of painful uh, injuries to areas that may be caused by overuse or repetitive tasks. So think about what it is that we do as dental professionals and why we would hurt, right? Why we would be exposed to injury. So what does the science say? This is all very, very important. So this was a study uh, conducted. It was on the uh, occupation-related musculoskeletal disorders among dental professionals. Um, and so here, it pretty much highlighted the prevalence of musculoskeletal disorders, um, stating that dentists suffered from maximum musculoskeletal pain. Um, they actually studied different healthcare professionals, and dentists rated, rated the highest at 61%, uh, followed with general surgeons at 37%. So you can see just um, in the profession alone that we are certainly suffering. There was another study conducted, and so this study focused, it focused on ill health retirement and what caused people to uh, retire prematurely. And so the aim of this study, which was by, the, by means of a questionnaire, was to determine the factors that have contributed to premature retirement of general practitioners due to ill health. And the common cause of this was musculoskeletal disorders. 90% of the respondents um, selected general practitioner as their last job title and reported that um, it was musculoskeletal disorders that caused them to retire prematurely. So this ergonomics, again, I know that I said that this has been recently highlighted, but unfortunately it should have been highlighted or should remain the focus of what we do um, because we are at greater risk of, of injury in uh, retiring from what it is that we want to do far earlier than we would want to. Here are a few other studies that I wanted to highlight for you. So the study here on the left-hand side studied the occupational risk factors for musculoskeletal diseases in Western countries. And again, um, the prevalence rate of musculoskeletal disorders and pain among dental professionals ranged anywhere from 10.8% to 97.9%. And then the study here on the lower right um, study disorders amongst dental hygiene uh, students. And it reports, again, that the most common areas were the neck, upper back, and lower back. Now, remember, your hand is connected to all of those things. Um, this study was important to me because very early on my, in my career, I started to experience a lot of back, shoulder, and neck pain, not realizing that it had started to generate from what I was using in, in my hand. Another study here, um, examining musculoskeletal disorders in dental hygienists. Okay, 96% of dental hygienists in this study reported pain. 
So again, guys, the science is here supporting what I'm what I'm saying. So what are the types of injuries that we are suffering from? Um, and a lot of hygienists, we do, we suffer a lot of hand, wrist, and finger injuries. The most common being carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, what are the, but there are several others, of course, that we can suffer from as listed here on the slides. So what causes these injuries? Again, the awkward positions. Imagine, especially when we're using our hand instruments with an uncooperative patient, you, it's like you're almost doing acrobatics some days, right? You're trying to twist and bend to get the job done because that's what we do. Um, it's caused by repetitive tasks or static positions. So if you're in an operatory where you can't move around and you're, you're holding those hand instruments, um, you're, you're just stationary. And so that can uh, pose a problem. And they're repetitive tasks. Have you ever stopped to count how many strokes you perform in one day? I, ask, I love to ask people those questions. How many strokes do you perform each day when you're using your hand instrument? So, but it's, you, you don't know, most people don't count, but it's that, you know, it's repetitive. You're doing it over and over and over again. And then of course, other <clears throat> causes for these injuries would be the amount of pressure we're applying. So in order to shave or to pop that calculus off, um, Hygienists are using far too much pressure. Um, and then the grip, how uh, tight are we holding the instrument? So that pressure is what gets us into trouble. So this is why the instruments that you use matter, okay? And what we're gonna talk about later on is, you know, in instrument designs, specifically instrument handle designs that address um, that pressure and that, uh, that grip. Um, in addition to the hand, wrist, and finger injuries, you know, I do want to address the neck, the elbow, and the shoulder injuries. Many of you reported in our initial poll that you are suffering um, with these types of injuries. So this is just an example of, you know, the neck and back injuries. You have your tension neck syndrome. You move on to your shoulder injuries where you could have the rot rotator cuff injury. And then we move on to elbow and forearm injuries. Believe it or not, guys, and, you know, it, it may be hard to accept that what you are holding in your hand could actually lend themselves or lend itself to some of these injuries that you may be suffering from. Here's another study that I wanted to highlight. This study was on musculoskeletal disorders among dental hygienists in Canada, and this was conducted in June of 2020. This was a quantitative cross-sectional uh, survey that was distributed to a dental hygienist in Canada to assess the prevalence and types of uh, occupational musculoskeletal disorders. And uh, what they found uh, here is that the most common disorders were the carpal tunnel syndrome and tendinitis, so mainly um, in the hand. And there was a positive correlation between the number of years in practice and the incident. So what this is telling us is that the longer we practice, um, the more we are likely to experience these types of disorders. Um, but what was interesting about this is they felt like if they had, the, the respondents, they felt like if they had had received adequate training on injury pre uh, prevention in school, um, they may not have suffered as, as much. And so here the study is telling us that, you know, in addition to what we're doing for practicing clinicians, we really need to take it back to the schools. How are we going to help save, um, you know, our future hygienists? And it really starts in school. So the risk factors for developing these musculoskeletal disorders and repetitive strain injuries, we definitely addressed them, the awkward positions, the static working positions. I talked about force, um, that pressure, that force. We talked about the repetitive movements in confined spaces, but I definitely want to talk about equipment. And what do I mean when I say equipment? So before I uh, answer that, I would like to uh, launch another poll question. So if we could get that going, please. Okay, the question is, which factor has the greatest impact of ergonomics? Um, select one, please, on positioning and instruments, operator's tool, 
all of the above. Give you just a few more seconds to get your responses in. Okay. Let's see what our results are. Okay, we're getting a very good participation. Thank you. Uh, positioning 10% and instruments 11%, operator stool um, 1%, and 78% all of the above. Thank you for sharing those results, Auntie. So 78%. Um, I'm, this is probably the first time that I've, I've seen such a low percentage for operator stool. And the reason why I say that's shocking to me, um, just because over the past few years, there's been a great push for um, people to change the stool that they are uh, sitting in. Um, and I know that we constantly hear people talk about positioning, but I rarely hear people talk about the um, implications of hand instruments in ergonomics. So that is what I'm going to talk to you about now. Thank you, Oxy. So what do I mean by equipment? Of course, the clinician's chair, the operator's stool. Um, you know, there's been a big push for people to use saddle stools. Positioning, we talk about um, gloves. Your gloves actually will impact ergonomics. Your visual acuity, meaning how well can you see? Because if you can't see, you're going to overcompensate by moving your body. Uh, but your hand instruments, especially when you are performing periodontal procedures day in and day out, your hand instruments are going to be what you really need to focus on. And in particular, the handle design for that hand instrument. Depending on the handle design and what you choose to use in your hand, you are going to set yourself up for success because you are going to reduce the incidence of your musculoskeletal disorder or repetitive strain injury exposure. So we really need to consider what are the ergonomic design features for periodontal instruments, in particular, the handle. So according to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, dental hygienists rank highest of all professions of having carpal tunnel. And I'm saying this again, we are at risk because of our repetitive movements and the pinch force in our grasp. And what do I mean by pinch force? How tight are you holding your instrument? Anything you hold for over 2000 hours a year should be comfortable, right? So you're, you're not holding the working end of the instrument. You're not holding the shank of the instrument. You're holding the handle. And so, how it's designed, how much it weighs, how it feels can certainly have a profound impact on your performance, your productivity, but also long-term your exposure to musculoskeletal and repetitive strain injuries. So what is it that we do know? We do know that over the past 15 years, technology behind hand instrumentation has exploded most clinicians are not aware of what's out there. Um, and so what happens far too often is that you're using what you've been trained on in school or what's available in the office. And that may not necessarily be with standard of care or what's good for you ergonomically. So what we need to do is, so, so what should you be using? That's the question of the day, right? So let's take a look at that. Uh, the one thing that you always need to consider when considering what to hold in your hand is that you want to look to the science. You want to be able to incorporate that new technology. So handle recommendations. What should you be looking for? You should be looking for a handle that has a larger diameter, that's lighter in weight or perhaps hollow. Um, why am I saying this? Because it helps to reduce pinch force and it's less stress on the muscle. And again, we talked about that pinch force. That's how tight are you holding that instrument? You wanna look for an instrument that has tapering near the shank, right? Um, and that starts with the handle all the way down. Again, 
that helps to reduce uh, pinch force. It helps the fingers to couple on the handle. It also reduces your finger slipping in a wet environment. And unless someone has an extreme dry mouth, you're going to be working in a wet environment. And then last, um, your handle should have some sort of texturing on it. And that helps to reduce the friction between the fingers, um, which in turn helps to reduce pinch force. This also helps the clinician to maintain control in a wet environment. What does the research tell us? So I talked about using an instrument that is lighter, right? So there's a study here um, that studied the effects of periodontal instrument handle design on hand muscle load and pinch force. And what this study um, showed is that instruments lighter than 15 grams may require less pinch force. And I can tell you that the instruments I used when I went to school were much heavier. Although they were thinner instruments, they were really, really heavy instruments. And you don't necessarily feel um, how heavy an instrument is day in and day out. It's just taking a toll on your muscle. Um, literature also suggests, um, again, you want to use um, instrument handles. This is a, a second study that's just su suggesting that the optimal weight for um, an instrument handle should be 15 grams or less, and it should also have some sort of padding to de decrease muscle activity. This is another research study that I found uh, really interesting. It studied the effects of four different commercially available instrument handle designs. Um, they had various weights and diameters. And again, we know that instrument handle design has an effect on forearm muscle activity and the preferences. Um, what they found with this study is that uh, hygienists really favored more of the diameter. They were more concerned about the diameter um, more so than the weight. So we talked about weight, but diameter, so how wide the instrument is, um, is impactful as well. So we know that there are many different instrument handle designs on the market. Which one is better? So I would like for us to launch the next poll question, please. Okay, and the question is, what type of handle do you prefer? Um, please select one, resin, silicone, rock polymer, stainless steel. And thank you for your participation in these polls. This is great information. a few more seconds to get your responses in and then we will launch the results. Okay, we should be ready here. Okay, again, correct percentage there. Thank you for voting, voicing your preference. 15% uh, resin, 63% silicone, 5% rock polymer, 17% stainless steel. Okay, so we definitely have some, some favorites in here. Um, so this is good information. Thank you, Auntie. I appreciate you sharing those results for us. All righty, let's go to the next slide here. Okay. So what have we seen? There has certainly been a shift in the evolution of ergonomic handle design. So again, when I went to school, all of my instruments had very thin handles. Um, they were really heavy and they were just very boring. Um, I don't think that I realized that there were so many different handle designs, maybe, um, I would say maybe five to 10 years after I graduated, I started to see instruments with, with wider handles. Um, but um, again, if you're not someone who goes to a lot of uh, dental trade shows, um, if you don't attend CE regularly, especially on instrumentation, you really have no idea what's out there, right? 
So I do want to talk to you about uh, this handle here. This handle here was designed and manufactured by LM. Um, what we've seen over the past few years, um, and particularly recently, is you know a lot of companies are starting to put the focus on instrument handle design. Um, LM was the first dental manufacturer to develop an ergonomic handle design. Um, so they've been doing this since the 1980s. In fact, ergonomics has been the driving force behind their product development. Um, they started with the original handle, which you see there, which was the Ergo Max. And since then, they've invested in science and technology, and they've come out with a new and improved handle, came out with this in 2014, actually, and that is the LM Ergo Sense. So LM isn't new to the, the ergonomic handle design. They've been doing this. They put lots of research into uh, developing what they know will uh, benefit their clinicians, okay? And so what you will see is that you will see that this instrument definitely, this handle in particular, it does have a, it's a thicker handle. Um, unfortunately, we're not in person, so you can't feel it, but it is certainly lightweight. It has an optimal shape, so it allows that handle to really sit in your hand nicely. It has a silicone surface, so if you remember what I said, um, some of the research stated that there should be some sort of, of padding, right? Um, so that silicone surface, it's a medical grade silicone, helps to pad that handle. And it's also color coded. So this instrument, if you just look at it and you think about how long this company has been investing in ergonomic handle designs, this is, you know, ideal. Uh, worth noting is that many of the LM design features have become the industry standard for the 21st century. But I also want to highlight, remember um, I stated in one of the scientific studies, um, weight was important, but diameter. Diameter played the biggest part in how clinicians felt the instrument uh, performed and how well it felt in their hand. So this handle is one of the widest on the market at about 13.7 uh, millimeters wide, or you can say 14 millimeters. So I wanted to just provide you some information on um, what a silicone grip can do. So a silicone handle um, in this one study here on the upper left caused the lowest perceived strain in both fingers, palm and thumb. Um, so the results of this stated work productivity was the best with the thickest silicone handle. So of course, in this study, they had uh, participants use a variety of handles. Okay. Um, and so, you know, they definitely talked about there was no statistically significant difference for the muscle activity for the four muscle groups that were studied, but it's, it's what um, the clinician perceives, right? And so that's very important. Beings have to be comfortable. Um, there's another study here on the lower left that definitely talked about um, the diameter and the reduced force and load on the hand during scaling. Um, this also studied the silicone handle. This study suggested that the use of silicone instrument handles may improve hand comfort and reduce hand fatigue. And of course we know our, uh, our research never, never stops. And so the beautiful thing um, about LM is that they're continuing to invest in the science to produce the best instruments and the best ergonomically designed handles that um, they can offer. So how do you determine, you know, I'm, I've talked about a lot of things here and I just wanna, you know, throw this out there. All dental manufacturers have good instruments, right? Um, but how do you decide, you know, the thing here is that we're talking about what instrument is going to benefit you the most ergonomically. So what are some of the things that you should consider, right? So the texturing and the knurling, right? So resin, resin based handles have a texture on them. Some of your stainless steel instruments have um, texturing and knurling on them. You want to consider the shank of the instrument. Um, that's very important when you want to talk about uh, the different types of procedures you need to perform. So heavier deposits will require a specific shank design. Um, while, you know, if you're not removing as much deposit, you may want a different shank design. Your working in, of course, matters. How durable is the instrument? Can it, can it stand up? 
to, you know, with, with all that you are doing with it. And then of course, does it feel good in your hands? That truly matters at the, the end of the day. It has to feel good. Okay, so let's talk about outside of the handle, what are some of the other um, design improvements? So just overall, I can tell you that some of these advancements have helped to lessen um, outside of the actual handle design. The other features have helped to lessen the incidence of injury and musculoskeletal disorder. So again, modified working ends, modified shank designs. Um, these advancements increase patient comfort um, during treatment and they account for the different anatomical variations. So there's not a one size fit all instrument for everyone. It's not a badge of honor to tell someone that I can take one instrument and clean a person's ent a entire mouth because everybody's different. I, I can tell you that you're, you're missing something, right? Um, and then of course, these instruments allow us to treat uh, people with more advanced periodontal diseases. Um, for us to use one instrument to treat the entire mouth, we are going to be part of the problem. We are why um, there's no resolution in disease if we're not using our tools effectively. And then of course, there's the, the technology and the types of materials that are being used. So instruments are staying sharper longer and then some instruments you don't need to sharpen at all. So all of these uh, design modifications outside of the handle, you have the, the you know, changing or improvements in the metals, changes in the shanks, turns, changes in the working in, they all offer ergonomic benefits. What we have also found is that a lot of instrument companies are creating hybrid designs. So this allows uh, the clinician to create setups with fewer instruments. So what do I mean by hybrid design? So you know you have your sickle scalers, you have your area curette, area specific curettes, and your universal curettes. And so these hybrid designs are combining the features of all three. So for example, let's just say you have a um, double Gracie or dual Gracie. Typically you need a set of Gracies to uh, instrument the distal, facial, and mesial surface. So with these hybrid designs, you're no longer switching from a, you know, a Gracie 13, 14 for the distal to a Gracie 11, 12 to do the facial and mesial with these hybrid designs like your double Gracie and your dual Gracie, you're able to go from the distal across the facial to the mesial with just one instrument. So let's just say you complete the entire facial side. In order to do the lingual side, you would just flip the end of the instrument. So again, that's fewer setups. And so that can you know, make a difference for a lot of clinicians. Pressure, so like, the handle design, um, a lot of these other uh, advancements, um, the metals that are being used, um, the working in design, all of these modifications help to lessen the amount of pressure that is being applied by the clinician. So I've talked about uh, pressure quite a bit, uh, and we talked about that pinch pressure. So that is that grat how tight are you holding your instrument? But there are two other uh, pressure forces at play. So of course there's the pressure that you use with your fulcrum. So that's the amount of pressure that you are using with your uh, ring finger. You're placing it on some area in the mouth to provide stability. And then of course there is the pressure of the working in against that tooth. So that's that lateral pressure, right? Um, so when I was in school and how most people are taught, especially when you're using a traditional stainless steel instrument, is that in order to pop that calculus off, you have to apply a, a lot of lateral pressure. But again, the more pressure you're applying, you are um, exposing yourself to developing one of these disorders. So with the newer technologies, you no longer have to apply that pressure. Um, depending on the type of instrument that you're using, instead of trying to pop the calculus off with lots of pressure, you can simply shave it off with very little pressure. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next few slides. The advancements in the, the metal can be attributed to metallurgy. So what is that? 
Um, so it's really combining the science and technology of uh, metals. And so, you know, again, I, when I was in school, you literally, I literally had to sharpen my instrument. I felt like every, after every stroke, but with the advancements in metallurgy, um, this is how these instruments are staying sharper longer. They've been able to manipulate the properties of metal and uh, predict and exploit their behaviors to create a lot of the wonderful instruments that we have here on the market. There have been advancements in cryogenic processing. And so what it, that's when instruments go through a heating and cooling process to make the metal stronger and more wear resistant. Um, a lot of times you'll hear instrument manufacturers talk about the Rockwell hardness scale. Uh, dental instruments are now over 60 with some instruments as high as 64. Um, and then just the, the different types of metals that are being used in general. So uh, the different type for the, those instruments that are metal, okay, we have you know, been able to benefit from the creation of stainless steel instruments that don't have to be sharpened as frequently. We've also been able to benefit from specially coated instruments that do not have to be sharpened at all. So again, this has allowed us to benefit from um, just the different design modifications to help us provide more comprehensive care to our patients. But again, when you're not having to sharpen your instrument as much, um, if the metal is stronger or if you're not having to sharpen the instrument at all, these are the design features that uh, offer ergonomic benefits because it's not, it makes it so that we don't have to apply as much pressure. Um, I talked about instruments staying sharper longer. Again, that's the benefits of the, the metallurgy and cryogenic processing. Um, so again, I talked about the instrument staying sharper longer. You will see some of this technology here. Um, so you, I'll just read it out. You have your EverEdge 2.0, Smart Sharp Technology, Xdora, Talent Tough, Dura great max. This means these are the advancements. These instruments, um, these metals are so much better than what they were 20 to 25 years ago. So they allow us to, to perform um, with precision. That's that's key, right? To remove that deposit with precision, but we don't have to, to sharpen as often. And that's really good. Um, you're probably wondering why I have a piece of cake up here and wondering how in the world does this relate to the presentation? Um, I like food, so I like to use a lot of food analogies quite often. And, you know, I'm on a diet, so this, this picture is really not serving me well right now. But um, just imagine being able to have your cake and eat it too, meaning in one instrument, um, you could have an uh, instrument that features all of the technological advancements in metallurgy along with science and innovation in the handle design. So not only do you have a perfect handle, but you have a perfect metal to go along with that. Well, you know, it is possible. You get that with some of these uh, LM instruments. Um, what I, I want to highlight to you is you, you can have the best of both worlds. Um, for those of you who love stainless steel, you can still have a stainless steel instrument with an ergonomically designed handle. So LM has a line of instruments called DuraGrade Max. Uh, DuraGrade Max um, is the working ends are stainless steel, meaning they're uncoated, um, but the, the, the metal is a super steel, it, it is resistant. So it's a super steel and it's immune to corrosion and this can be resharpened. So let's, let's you know, what I love about dental instruments, again, is that it's not one size fit all and there's something for everyone and not everyone can appreciate a sharp and free instrument and that's okay. Um, so LM still does offer you a stainless steel instrument with the same ergonomically designed handle. So, you know, you can't forget that your handle is just important. But for those of you who don't like to sharpen and then they want that extra added ergonomic benefit of a sharp and free instrument, LM has a line called LM Sharp Diamond. So again, the working in is coated so that the instrument then becomes completely sharp and free, okay? 
um, as an educator, these instruments work for me. Um, I fell in love with the handle design, number one, because it just felt awesome in my hand. But as an educator, the way that this instrument handle is designed and the feel of it, that silicone grip, it has helped my students who are learning even how to uh, learning how to use the, the perfect modified pen grasp, it helps them to stay in that grasp. But I'll also say that they do have other instruments in their kit. I feel a significant difference when I use these instruments and so do my students. But I'll also offer that, um, you know, I have a new faculty member who was a former student of mine and she's like, you know, I, I really just, I really prefer a traditional um, traditional instrument. This this doesn't work for me and, and it's okay. So again, ultimately you have to do what's best for you. But I can tell you with these instruments, again, you get the, the handle that we know is going to help protect you and offer you ergonomic benefits. And then you get the benefit of that stainless steel. Uh, and if you wanna sharpen or coat it in if you don't like to sharpen. And then if it couldn't get better, um, let's just say you want it to be able to track your instruments in this ErgoSense handle. If you choose, you can have it embedded um, with a radio frequency uh, identification chip. And this offers several benefits to uh, offices. You can find out how long you have the instrument, how often it's been sterilized. But again, this is just an extra bonus. Uh, I just wanted to briefly talk about design modifications. And so um, we talked about parts of the working in being modified. So with many of the instruments we find, and even with the LM instruments, um, the working ends have been miniaturized and, and modified. And so you now have, you know, your after fives where the shank has been extended or you have your minis where the working end has, has been uh, miniaturized. And so these types of modifications allow us to go into deeper pockets with our hand instruments to scale for cations more effectively. And these designs also really account for the anatomical variations that we see on the root surface. So um, again, all types of amazing things with instruments. Again, how do you choose? How do you know which instrument um, to choose? Uh, research says you should certainly choose a wide handle, right? Um, the wider the handle, uh, the better. Um, that's what the science is telling us. You certainly want to choose an instrument that's a, a less than 15 grams. But again, you don't want an instrument that's two grams, right? Because then you're gonna really apply too much pressure to hold on to it. You want something that's durable. You want an instrument uh, with a good steel um, that's going to maintain an edge and that's going to be wear resistant. Again, all companies make good instruments. Some are more ergonomically friendly than others and some last longer than others, right? Ultimately, the best instrument is the one that is going to feel good in your hands, right? I say I have a preference, but what feels good to me and what works for me may not necessarily work for you. I just wanted to show you um, a picture. This happens to be one of my favorite instruments. Again, it feels great in my hand. Um, this is a picture that I use to teach my students on how to maintain an assessment grasp and an instrument grasp, and it just lays right in my hand. And I'm able to, you know, hold the instrument in just the right right places. And I just I just can't say enough about it. So what are some if you are in the the market for uh, new instruments? This is just a slide here. Uh, things that you need to consider. Um, the tips of the instruments, you see ergonomics of the handle, ergonomics of the handle, ergonomics of the handle. You guys, if you're going to be doing a lot of scaling, you definitely want to consider the ergonomics of the handle. I put color of the handle up here. Um, I, I don't want to say that my teachers were cool um, in school. They, they certainly helped me, but I had to be able to identify my instrument simply by looking at the working end. And that can be um, an acquired skill. 
but for some people they don't have time. So consider the color, different instruments have different colors. And so that could be helpful so that you're not fumbling around on the tray trying to figure out uh, what instrument to pick up. The relationship with your salesperson, um, they often know what's new, what's brand new. A lot of times they are equipped with some of the, the science. So that may be um, a resource for you. Cost, um, but I'm going to caution you about cost because you do not want to compromise quality to save a few pennies. You certainly want to consider your patient population and the number of procedures that you're performing. And then I say the length of the time that the instrument stays sharp, especially if you're someone who doesn't like to sharp or you're not proficient with it. We always need to uh, be mindful that we have to be productive and patient-centered. And what do I mean by that? Um, the dental office is a healthcare business. Your primary care provider, although they're providing you care, it's still a business. And uh, we know that in order to be a successful business, we have to be mindful of our numbers. So we need to be mindful, especially um, as dental hygienists, of our systems and protocols. Um, how else could we potentially um, increase our productivity? Your dental hygiene instruments can help you make money or can cause, cause you to lose it. So if you are using instruments that are not designed um, to benefit you ergonomically, what happens is that you hurt, you have to take time off of work. And either you get a temp in who doesn't know what to do or there's no replacement at all, or you're fumbling around with an instrument that doesn't have a sharp edge. So it's taking you longer to perform procedures or you know, you're know you applying too much pressure and your patient is unhappy. So your instruments matter. Yes, your instruments can uh, impact your production. So uh, definitely you want to, thinking about instruments, you always want to focus on those things that are going to uh, facilitate biofilm removal and calculus removal. You certainly want to adopt the science. I'm going to say this again, consider the ergonomic implications of the tools you invest in, but you have to invest in them. Okay, some of you probably are wondering like, my gosh, what have I been using all my life? And yeah, you need to invest in, in what's new. And sometimes it means that you have to invest in yourself and not necessarily wait for someone to do the investment for you. So um, in closing, we talked about, you know, musculoskeletal disorders commonly experienced by dental professionals, what their causes are, how to prevent them, again, one way to prevent is to make sure you're investing in an ergonomically designed handle. We talked about the ergonomic considerations of dental instrument handles, weight being one, how it's designed, the shape, how it's padded, the diameter. And then um, what are some of the ergonomically designed equipment and hand instruments that minimize ergonomic risk? So outside of the handle, we also talked about you know, the types of metals, whether it be coated or uncoated, so stainless steel or coated, um, coated meaning sharp and free, and just you know, the, the other uh, design modifications such as uh, shank designs and tip design. I want to thank you for joining me this morning, this afternoon for this presentation. I hope that I was able to provide you with some information that can be useful to you in your career. Again, I just wanted to put this disclaimer up. Um, apply your own professional judgment and experience with respect to all of the information that has been provided for you today. And now I would like to take this opportunity to answer any questions anyone may have. And I will start to share my camera. I'm ready to answer any questions. So Auntie, if there are any questions, if you could uh, read them aloud for me and I would be more than happy to answer them. Yeah, so far, so good. We haven't had any questions. This was comprehensive. Thank you, Dr. Choi. Just a okay. reminder, if you are a participant uh, here from the US, you will receive um, email information uh, for your CE credit. Let me check again if we have any, any questions here. Takes a little bit to scroll through. It's okay. 
and it's always um you guys can i get lots of questions um post presentation so always feel free um, to email me if you think of anything after this that you would like to ask. Okay, I am not seeing questions here, so we can we can always um, um, get back to them at the later date, like you said. Absolutely. Okay, so on uh, behalf of LM Dental, and, and Plameka, uh, Dr. Choi, thank you very much. And thank you for all of you who participated. Um, we appreciate it. And um, our hope is that if you're already using our products, thank you. If you haven't tried the products or if you haven't tried the new ones, give them a go. The chances are you might just like them. Thank you, everyone.